Tonight, what I would like to emphasize to you is not their characteristics, not what they have done, but their total obedience to God. We can learn from them and perhaps uh, uh, be like them in our obedience to the Lord. Let me start with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus entered history when the land of Israel was under the control and the yoke of Rome and considered an insignificant post, outpost of the vast and mighty Roman Empire. At the time, the Roman Empire is so big, bigger than the Grecian Empire, bigger than the Babylonian Empire, bigger than the Middle Persian Empire. They're able to control uh, most of Europe, part of Asia, and part of Africa. Big, big, big empire. And I would think that the land of Israel, a very small country, is just considered an insignificant outpost of this mighty Roman Empire. The presence of the Roman soldiers in Israel, and you would notice that even in world history, studying the Roman Empire, not much about Israel is mentioned. And it's only mentioned in the Bible because Israel is the very center of biblical history. You would notice from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the land of Israel. When I speak of the land of Israel, I don't speak of a small strip of land that you see today. All right? That is not Israel. That is just a small strip of land. The whole of Israel is called by historians as the Fertile Crescent. Why the Fertile Crescent? Because that land is the richest and the most fertile land all over the earth. It's not the Philippines, all right? It is the whole land of Israel, all right? You would look at the, the, the land of Israel in the south from the northern tip of the Nile River is already Israel, all right? The northern tip of the Nile River, the boundary of Egypt is Israel already. And to the north would include Lebanon. All right? Would include Lebanon. That is Israel. That would be in the old map, Tyre and Sidon. Okay? All together, way up north. If you have, if you have the map uh, of uh, the old map in your own Bible, there you're going to see what is right here now. For example, the wilderness of Sur, the whole of Canaan. The whole of Canaan is the land of Israel. And if you look at this, you'll find out that to the north, it would be up to the boundary of, uh, of between Europe and Asia. To the south is the tip the northern tip of the Nile River. And you would, you would, of course, know that the Nile River is a very important tributary, water tributary in the land of Egypt. Okay. In the northeast, in the northeast, you would go up to the tip of the Euphrates River. 
and that's a big land, the Euphrates River. It will even go up. It will even join, it will even join part of Iraq today. Okay? Uh, and then to the south of that, you would notice that includes even Syria. It includes even Libya. That is the vast land of Israel. Now, in biblical history, that's the very center of civilization. And we call it Jewish civilization. Do you know why in all of the empires from Babylonian to the Roman Empire, that they would conquer that vast land. Do you know why? Because it is so rich. Mm -mm. All right? And do you know why even today, in the 21st century, there is still fighting on that land to control it? The U.S., England, Russia, China. Because that part of the land, especially when you go into the Galilean Peninsula, going down to the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea is so rich with uranium that you can build, you can build atomic bombs with a lot of nuclear warheads in it and destroy the whole world. No one wants you Huh? Yung buong dead sing yan, napakayaman yan sa uranium. Yan ang chemical na ginagamit sa paggawa ng nuclear warheads. Now whether it be used for power or used for war. Okay? Ang sabi nila, yung uranium deposit doon sa Dead Sea, pwedeng gumawa ng nuclear warheads na pwede mag-destroy sa buong mundo. That's how rich it is. At dun na sa sentro ang conflict in, in terms of biblical history, although in world history, the center of conflict is Europe. All right? Europe. America is not known during that time. America is only known in the 19th century. But America is not part of world history from the 18th century on down. Okay? No one knew about All right. So take note of that. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you biblical geography and history here. Learn it. Okay? Now, Jesus entered that history. The Lord Jesus Christ was born in that part of the world, in that part of an event. The presence of the Roman soldiers in Israel gave the Jews the military peace, but at the price of oppression. Now you take note that it was the Roman Empire that implemented implemented democracy that was conceived by the Grecians. So therefore, ang ibig sabihin nun, ang bawat probinsya ng Roman Empire ay binigyan ng autonomy. Ano ba niya ba? Binigyan po sila ng autonomy. But of course, the emperor, the emperor is a dictator of sorts. Now, why did I say dictator of sorts because he is not actually a total dictator. Why? Because there is a senate in the Roman Empire and the senate in the Roman Empire the civilian senate were chosen by the emperor and elected by certain people. Part of that senate were generals like Mark Antony, all right? And you would think that Mark Antony is just in the, in the pigment of the mind of 
William Shakespeare. And that is a true character. Okay. So, yun ang Senado. Sa Senado, ay pinag-uusapan nila lahat ng bagay. Digmaan, batas, civil and authority, yung pag- uh, yung pag-appoint ng mga governors ng mga probinsya, katulad ni King Herod ng Judea. Alright? Pero ang pinaka- leader dyan ay walang iba kundi ang Roman Emperor which are led by the so-called Caesars. Lahat po ng Emperor ng Rome are called Caesars. We read here in the book of Luke how that when Christ was born, the first Caesar became the Emperor. His name was Caesar Augustus. Hindi po Caesar Kayanan. Caesar Augustus po. Alright? At marami pa. Marami pa. Si Constantine the Great, Caesar yan. Oo. Si Nero, Caesar yan. Si Caligula, Caesar po yan. Okay. Uh, I think you've heard of Caligula. Hindi ba? Caesar po lahat yan. Lahat ng emperor ng Roma are called Caesar. Alright? Now, doon nabuhay ang ating Panginoon. Sa unang-unang panunungkulan ng unang Caesar, Caesar Augustus, though they have peace given by the military and that the province of Judea was ruled by an Edomian whose name was Herod, appointed by the emperor, but still there was oppression, there was slavery, there was injustice and there was gross immorality. All right? That is the picture of Rome. If, if, if you will just look at what Rome was, it is so full of evil, you cannot even believe the way they live. All right? From the emperor to the senators, to the governors, practice sexual orgy. From the emperors to the senators to the governors were homosexuals and bisexuals. And you would think that only evil, only today we have gross immorality given by the LGBTs. But during the Roman Empire, homosexuality is not only rampant, homosexuality is a normal day-to-day affair. That's how evil the Roman Empire was. All right? Nakuha niyo ba sa sabi ko? Aside from when they put up the Roman Colosseum in Rome, in which gladiators would be trained to fight each other. And many of them are believers. They are put into a big prison and they are asked to practice so they can defend themselves. Because if they will not practice and bear arms, all right, they will be killed inside the Colosseum. So, yan ay event, a regular event in Rome na pinapanood ng emperor at lahat ng mga, ng mga high, top-end rulers of the Roman Empire. Libu-libu yan. Alright? Andun sila, hindi yan boxing. Hindi yan UFC. UFC ba tawag doon? Ha? Patayan yun. Oo, patayan. Ang tawag doon, matira ang matibay. Alright? Patayan yan. Pero hindi lang yun ang nangyari dyan. Nakikita niyo may ha? Ang mga Kristiyano noong araw, hindi pinipersecute ng Rome. Ang nagpipersecute ng Kristiyano, ang mga Hudyo, hindi ang Rome. 
ang ginagawa ng Rome, lahat ng mga Kristiyano pinipresent sa Coliseum. Ha? At doon sa gitna ng Coliseum, naglalabas sila ng lahat ng klasing hayop. Tigre, leon, lahat ng mga bangis na hayop. And there, they have to defend themselves. And most of the time, they are killed. That is how cruel Rome was. So cruel. And you know what? When Constantine the Great embraced Christianity, Tao, but he was not really a believer in Christ. And later, the Roman Catholic Church was established. The Holy Roman Catholic Church. They brought with them the orgies and the cruelty of the Roman Empire. Do you realize that? And if you look at history, the Roman Catholic Church is the most wicked religion in the world. We have the Halis, the book, the Halis book of uh, history there by that. So you're going to read the wickedness in the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? Doon na buhay ang ating Panginoon. But then you find that into this kind of world came the promised Messiah. When the world at its, at its peak, okay, at the peak of immorality and wickedness, Jesus came. It only tells us here, just like what Paul said, Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am chief. But then you would notice that Christ is the perfect example of obedience. In John 17, verse number 4, John 17, verse number 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. At one point, the Lord Jesus Christ even as a man wanted to give up. At one point, the Lord Jesus Christ said, let this cup pass from me. And what is that cup? That is the cup of suffering. Ang sabi ng Panginoon Jesus sa kanyang ama, Lord, Can I, can I get out of this? Because he knew, he knew the gravity of the sufferings he had to endure. Yet, despite all that, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And that is total obedience. You get that? Say amen so we won't sleep. Amen. Make it louder. Amen. You know, there's a lot of believers who are good, who are good starters. 
but bad finishers. They start, they start, they start, and they're not able to finish. I've made up my mind, folks, when I started this ministry, I'm going to finish this until the end of my life. That's why I'm still here. While many pastors quit on God after so many years, you know, I'm still here. And I, you've got to understand why many pastors quit. I understand that. They're human. They are weak. And when they begin to see that many of us, their, mem their members are not growing and they're not obedient, obedient to God, what, is, what would the pastor do? Quit. They get depressed. They get frustrated. They get burned out. A month ago, I think I was, I was still in the States. That a fundamental Baptist pastor in South Carolina, after the evening service, went into his office, got his gun, and blew his head off. Cannot take the pressure anymore. And I would even think that Brother Sims, no many years back, a very popular name in the Bible Baptist circle, Truman Dollar, a pastor of the Kansas City Baptist Temple, a church that runs about 4,000 people, and later became the pastor of Temple Baptist Church of Detroit, Michigan, a church that runs 7,000 people. After the evening service, went into his office, shut and locked the door, got his 357 and pointed it in his mouth and killed himself. Come on now, communicate with me. Madeline McPastor. A very celebrated pastor in Canada. A fundamental Baptist church. With big membership. Told his wife. <clears throat> I'll be gone for a while. Went to his office. And got his shotgun. And shot himself. On his face. Now, why would well-meaning, godly men do that? Because they cannot take the pressures of the ministry. They just cannot continue to obey. That's the reason why, if I ever get angry... After one hour, I laugh it off. The Lord just gave me a very good sense of humor. That helps me get the stress out. Because I guarantee you, if I will be serious all the time, looking at some members, that I don't even like their own faithfulness. I'm going to kill myself. Ilang mga pastor kahit sa Pilipinas, naloko yan. They became mentally deranged because they're going to take the pressure. Mas madaling maging presidente ng Pilipinas kasi maging pastor ng isang church. Alam niyo ba yan? Oh. Kita niyo, nagiging presidente ng Pilipinas, kinakailangan may topak ka. Pag may topak ka, magiging pangulo ka ng Pilipinas.
There's a lot of people who are good starters, but they're not good finishers. Total obedience is this. That when you dedicate your life to the Lord, when you surrender your all to God, you're going to finish the work. That's total obedience. You're going to finish it. Whatever the pressures might be, you're going to finish it. Whatever the troubles might be, whatever your weakness might be, whatever the accusations might be, whatever they tell you might be, you are going to finish the work. Do you know why? Because surrendered people like me are not responsible to man. They're responsible to God. Just like Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ did not tell the people there, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He told it to his own father. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. In the book of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 8, you look at how obedient the Lord was. Hebrews 5 eight. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he what? We see what? Now look at that, folks. Huh? Nakita niyo ba? Ang sabi nun, though he were a son. Okay? Though he were the son of God. He became man and he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. It means this, that sufferings are necessary for obedience. You will not obey if you don't suffer. If everything becomes too easy for you, you won't obey God. You need to suffer so you would know what obedience means. Now, let's look at the next person here. Joseph. Joseph, a direct descendant of David. Engaged to Mary. I told you already that, that, that engagement in the Jewish law is like marriage. But not officially, publicly declared. But it's marriage. One of the major characters God has chosen to be part of the family of the Lord Jesus. When he learned that Mary was with child, without him being responsible to it, he decided to divorce Mary secretly. But the angel of the Lord spoke to him in his dream and charged him not to be afraid to take Mary and live with her as her husband. And the foster father of the child. Because the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He understood to be the son of God. He understood that one day that child will grow up and will die on the cross. And will save his people from their sin. He understood that. Joseph obeyed God. He obeyed God though he was overwhelmed with the holiness of the situation. It was a holy event. He was not ready for it. He was not worthy of it. But he obeyed God. And before him was the unfolding of the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. The Savior of the world. The Bible spoke of Joseph. Just a just man. A just man. Loving an obedient son. You know what? The obedience of Joseph is a manifestation of his faith. And his faith overcame his doubts. His faith overcame his reservation. His faith overcame his confusion. He looked at the dream. He saw it. 
He believed in it and all of the confusions were driven away. Faith does that. And when you do not have a kind of a faith, you will not obey God. Because obedience is a manifestation of your faith in God. Buti nga tayo, meron tayong salita ng Diyos eh. Alala nyo ang sinabi ng Panginoon kay Thomas. Ang sabi niya, you believe me because you saw my wounds. Blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. And that's us. Because we just look on the word of God and believe this to be the word of God and put our faith in Christ Jesus. Total obedience of Joseph. The next is Mary. Mary, whose genealogy can be traced back to David also. Was a simple lady espoused to Joseph. God chose her to carry in her womb the child Jesus and caused her to be blessed by all generations. She obeyed God and performed one of the most important acts of obedience God has ever demanded of anyone and trusted God fully for everything, though she at first did not understand. God, she welcomed God's plan for her to be the mother of Jesus, embraced it, submitting herself totally to Jesus as her Lord and Savior. In fact, when she was giving her salutation, she called her own son her Savior and her Lord. The Bible described her to be a godly and a blessed woman and the handmaiden of the Lord. Though troubled, though fearful, Though not filled with all understanding, she completely accepted God's revelation. In the book of Luke chapter 1 and verse number 24. In Luke chapter 1 and verse number 24. Luke 1 and verse number 24. Is that the right verse? Twenty-nine, Luke one twenty-nine. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. When she saw the angel, she was troubled at her at his saying. And cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. She was troubled and she did not understand. But then in verse 38 of Luke chapter 1. Verse 38 of Luke chapter 1. It says. And Mary said. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. Do you see that? Be it unto me according to thy word. Mary submitted herself to the wishes of God. And Mary acknowledged the fact that the angel that spoke that to her actually were the words of God. And she totally obeyed. You know what? If you will... First of all, fully understand why you need to obey. You will not obey. Faith does not mean you've got to understand first. Faith means you've got to believe first and then you will understand. All right. Then number three, we have the shepherds. The announcement of the birth of Jesus was given to the humble shepherd 
of the Judean village of Bethlehem. Again, God the Father revealed the news about His Son to the lowly, simple, and humble people who gladly obeyed God and proclaimed the birth of the promised Messiah in all Judea. After the, after the, uh, the proclamation of the angel to the shepherds, anong ginawa ng shepherds? Bumaba sila sa hill. Iniwan nila yung kanilang mga tupa. Bumaba immediately, ha? And that was what? That was madaling araw. Di ba? Madaling araw. Bumaba sila. And they woke up those people and they proclaimed that Jesus was born. They were the excited proclaimers of Jesus. You see? Who would want to proclaim Jesus Christ at one o'clock in the morning? And if you don't think you have done that, there were several times when this Ecclesia was new, I would get my young people right there in the Rizal Park and at one o'clock in the morning, we're going to win souls in the Rizal Park. That's how excited we were. Nung araw, pag ako excited mag soul winning, wala na ako makitang tao sa daan. Hindi naman ako pwedeng kumatok ng alauna sa bahay, di ba? Magagalit sila. Anong ginagawa ko? Pumunta ako sa luneta. Doon ako nag-witness. Kasi kising pa yung mga tao doon eh. Mamasyal pa eh. Excitement. Excitement is necessary in obedience. Amen ba? Then number four, the wise men. The wise men. Little is known about the wise men, but the Bible spoke of them as learned men, intellectuals, leaders of the eastern lands who traveled to Jerusalem in constant search of the coming Messiah, traveling 1,200 kilometers of unpaved roads in the desert, braving even the sunstorm. Their long search was over. When they found the child Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Kings with his parents, they worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ, offered him their royal gifts, recognizing that Jesus is the eternal King whose kingdom is everlasting and far greater than all the kingdoms and powers of the world. They left their masters. They left, they left their Arabian kings to worship the king of kings who was just born. They were enduring and sacrificial givers. Do you realize that? You know, when you give, you do not need to travel 1,200 kilometers. You only have to come to this Ecclesia and you give your offerings here. But those people were enduring and sacrificial givers and they were cheerful too. In the book of Matthew, it is recorded that they did not return to Herod to report the whereabouts of the newly born king of kings. Though they were not Jews. Hindi po sila hudyo. Alright? But by faith, they obeyed the revelation of prophecy. By faith, by faith, they did not obey the star. By faith, they obeyed the revelation of prophecy. In the book of Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Matthew 2, verses 4 to 6. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he wrote, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, the priests in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet Micah, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. They, 
believe in the revelation of prophecy. And because they believe in that, they obeyed and traveled for long miles to be able to see the king of kings guided by a lonely star. Wise men. These are the four, the four people in the character, the, the four characters in the story of Christ's birth that became the picture and the example of not only obedience, but total obedience. You know, if you have been faithful, then afterwards you backslide and you come back. Yes, you obey, but that is not total obedience. And you have to ask yourself the question. Do I have the character of total obedience? Yeah. Number five, we have Herod. Who, what do you think of Herod? He is the epitome of evil. Herod the Great was the evil and wicked governor of Judah. During the time of Christ, he was made aware of the prophecy. It was told him by the priest of the coming promised king of the Jews. He didn't like it. He was troubled. He began to hate that prophecy. And when he learned that the wise men went back to their own countries without reporting back the location of the newly born Jesus... He was exceedingly angry, the Bible says, and ordered all Bethlehem, children from two years old and under, to be killed. That was the slaughter of the innocent. And the Bible says there was great weeping and mourning in all Bethlehem. Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 to 18. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. The word wroth means angry. And sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And all the coast thereof from two years old and under. And you know what? That, that would be the result of too much envy and too much jealousy. Verse 17. According, then, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying in verse 18, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. There was wailing because all of those innocent children were killed. He perceived Jesus to be a future threat to his position. He was jealous. He was envious. He was scheming. He was wickedly evil. Jealous, envious, scheming, wickedly evil. And you know what? These are the characters of disobedience. So, look at ourselves. How obedient are we? I'm not saying how perfect we are, we're not. But how obedient are we? What can hinder you to obey? What are the things in your own mind right now that will tell you, I will not obey? Those times. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, help thou our unbelief, dear God. Increase our faith, Lord. 
and may, because of that faith, gladly and excitedly obey you for the rest of our lives. Completely and totally yielded to your will. Thank you, dear God, for the example of the Lord Jesus, the example of Mary, the example of Joseph, the example of the wise man, the example of the shepherd. And we need those kind of people today in our age. We need those, dear Father. May you please bless the offerings now, Father. Thank you for your goodness and love for us. Bless us even as we go home tonight. Protect us, dear God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.